Starship Troopers was misunderstood in its time. In retrospect, it was a biting satire of jingoist propaganda, the military-industrial complex, and the ways in which we sell war to chil children. Wait, hold on. Sorry, I was talking about small soldiers. If you haven't seen Small Soldiers, that's... That's fine. The short version of the plot, which I won't get too much into in this video, basically goes like this. When a defense industry megacorporation takes over a toy company, the soldier and monster toys they design are accidentally imbued with sentience by surplus military-grade artificial intelligence processors. I know, this is full tilt style techno babble. I mean, it's like they're just making this tech crap up, right? Taking their programming a bit too seriously, the soldier toys called the Commando Elite try to hunt down the timid monsters, the Gorgonites, who just want to find their homeland and live a peaceful life. This film came out a few years after Toy Story and... I'll have your dog back. It shows. At times, it attempts serious social commentary, and it's not all bad. Um, don't you think that's a, um, a bit violent? Exactly. So don't call it violence. Call it action. Kids love action. It sells. Besides, what are you worried about? They're only toys. The film opens, for example, with an infomercial extolling the virtues of mixing consumerism and the military. Introducing advanced battlefield technology into consumer products for the whole family. For the first time, you and yours will enjoy the same high quality standards as demanded by the U.S. Defense Department at private sector prices. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. The company's CEO, Gil Mars, played to perfection by Dennis Leary, gets annoyed at a pitch meeting with two Heartland employees, played by Jay Moore and David Cross. Mars complains that the proposed commercial showing a toy soldier punching his way out of the box is unrealistic. Can they, uh, can they really do that? The thing where he punches his way out of the box. No. Didn't think so. He's upset because, wait, hold on a second, play that again? Did they remix Thus Spoke Zarathustra? Hang on, let me just, let me take a look here. Holy shit. Anyway, I'm sorry, Gil Mars had some problem with this absolutely perfect ad. What if these toys actually could talk? What if they could walk? What if they could actually kick but David Cross isn't convinced because of, well, the obvious reasons. You know, that kind of uh, computing power doesn't really seem feasible right now. Of course, when he says right now, he means the late 90s, but I'm not done being coy yet. But it's a very fair critique. And in response, Dennis Leary delivers what might be the best line of the whole movie. We can make missiles that can hunt down one unlucky bastard 7,000 miles away and stick a nuclear warhead right up his ass. I don't think we're gonna have a problem with this. <laughs> You bought a toy company! <laughs> to get around the problem of creating life, one of the inventors scours Globotech's hardware surplus for the totally real X1000 microprocessors designed for the military that are capable of learning. Then we get a manufacturing montage that shows how they make these toys and... Wait, hold up. This? This isn't fictional. This is real. Early in the montage, we see a blue 3D model on a computer screen as a plastic figurine emerges from some goo. It's designed to look like it's some high-tech sci-fi nonsense, but the process used to make these models appears to be just an early form of stereolithography. It's a method of 3D printing that uses UV light to harden liquid resin layer by layer until a fully formed product emerges. In fact, the step they're showing right here would most likely be an alcohol bath, a step done after the print is finished to rinse off excess resin. And then they added some lasers on top to make it look cool. In 1998, this was some advanced industrial technology. In fact, it was even used in the medical industry to 3D print physical models of body parts constructed using MRI and CT scans. But today, you can just buy this. Like, come here, let me show you. This is the Elegu Mars 3D resin printer. It costs like 200 bucks on Amazon, and you can use it to perform the exact same resin printing process that you see at the beginning of the movie. If you wanted to print your own major chip hazard, you could do it with this thing. And the more I watched how these toys work in the movie, the more I realized you could do all of it. 
Most of the advanced military technology in this 90s movie is commonplace now. You can just buy it off the shelf. At private sector prices. It's totally possible to make your own small soldier. So I did. Step one, Major Chip Hazard reporting for duty. To make my own small soldier, I need to start by finding a decent 3D model to print. But I couldn't find one online. So I did the dumbest thing you could do if you wanted to create your own action figure from scratch. I bought an action figure on eBay of Archer, Emissary of the Gorgonites, and a Major Chip Hazard... Wait, what is... Is... Is this an alarm clock? By not paying very close attention to what I was buying on eBay, I accidentally ended up with a chip that has a large concrete block where his legs should be, so I might need to lower my standards a bit. With a real action figure in hand, I could create a 3D model out of it using an app called Meshroom. By taking dozens, sometimes hundreds of photos of an object, Meshroom can build a model in 3D space using a process called photogrammetry. Amazingly, this even works with photos taken from your phone. So I took 123 photos of Chip from every possible angle to get as much detail as I could, and... nailed it. Next, I took the model into Blender to clean it up a bit and get it ready for 3D printing. There's a lot of extra cruft and stuff around the base that I could just delete. And it would have been awesome if I figured out that the smooth sculpting brush could remove a lot of the bumpiness before I printed the thing. But either way, the result was a pretty good looking model. Not professional or anything, but you can at least tell what it is. Now, by the way, Meshroom and Blender are both completely free. If you have the time and interest, I recommend checking them out. My model is all right, and I only spent like an hour of actual work on it, plus a few hours of letting my computer process. Someone who's less lazy than me could probably make something good. Next up, it was time to print this G.I. Joe. No! The print took about 12 hours, but if you look closely, you can see the resemblance in the process. The slicing software Chi2 box bears a striking resemblance to the software we see in the beginning of Small Soldiers as they're being printed. And as the models emerge in the film, you can even see the same struts underneath floating parts of the model, like arms. These are commonly used in 3D printing to ensure that a hand or something doesn't and print in the middle of nowhere and fall off before it gets attached to the body because, well, gravity is a thing. Once the model is printed, you can just pop those off, and what I'm left with is... SMALLER SOLDIERS! Okay, um... Now that I think about it, though, this doesn't actually m move. Like, it's got no points of articulation or anything. It's just... It's just one big block. I probably should have printed this in pieces. But I used up all my resin on it already, so... Um, I'm just gonna have to go with this. <sighs> okay, so there's obviously a lot more to making your own small soldier than printing one rigid figure. Uh, what was it Gilmars said they needed again? What if these toys actually could talk? What if they could walk? What if they could actually kick ass? Yeah, no, I think we can manage that. Step two, what if these toys could walk? Okay, so maybe walking is a little out of the question here. Step two, what if these toys were technically capable of physical movement? In the movie, the action figures are brought to life through a combination of puppetry and CGI. According to director Joe Dante, around one third of the scenes in the final cut of the movie used puppets, and those puppets were created by the legendary Stan Winston. Stan Winston was the Academy Award-winning special effects mastermind behind films including... all of these. In particular, you'd know his work from Alien, Terminator, Jurassic Park, and Inspector Gadget. Anyway, the point is, there's no way in hell I'm gonna be able to make this thing move the way Stan Winston does. But... we can give Chip an apparatus that technically qualifies as a movement capability. To give him a range of movement, I repurposed an old Me Arm kit. This is an open source design for a simple robotic arm that uses four servos to rotate, raise, and extend the arm, as well as close a clamp at the end of the arm. You can find the plans for this robotic arm on Thingiverse and laser cut your own parts out of plastic or wood. Or if you don't own a laser cutter, you can just buy the kit from their website. Conveniently, my old Me Arm kit matched Chip's translucent blue, so I meticulously used advanced engineering techniques to integrate the mechanical apparatus into Chip's blocky base thing, and... Yeah, that works. Now, to control these servos, we're going to need a hardware platform to connect them to. 
ideally something powerful enough to handle the more complex tasks we're going to throw at it later. Now, the X-1000 in the movie is some fake-ass garbage, but we do have a couple options to work with in real life. The $23 Arduino is a microcontroller that can be used to prototype and build custom electronics devices from automatic blinds to simple alarm systems. Meanwhile, the $35 Raspberry Pi is a bit more expensive, but it has a lot more processing power and can even function as a standalone computer. As a side note, one of the coolest uses for this thing is the RetroPie project that turns it into a cheap emulator for classic games. Now, my colleague, Thorin Klozowski, used to write about both platforms for Lifehacker, and he literally wrote the book on Raspberry Pi. So I asked him which one he thought would be better to recreate a robotic murder toy. And he said, Eric, this doesn't seem safe. So I went with a Raspberry Pi. Next, it was time to connect the servos on the Mi Arm to the Raspberry Pi itself, which can be done with just a few wires running to the GPIO pins. Oh, Chip now had a backpack robot arm capable of extending slightly above his head to reach the high shelf. Fuck. Given the incredibly low standards I've set for myself, this technically counts as a success. Step three, what if these toys could talk? Okay, but look, motorized parts are easy in general. But look, you wouldn't be impressed just because a toy could move some mechanical parts in response to stimuli, unless you think technology peaked with the Furby. Which, you know, fair. Instead, these action figures need to be able to talk, and not just play back sound effects. In the movie, they're seen having conversations, responding to questions. Making declarative statements? Formulating inquiries? So to figure out how to give these toys the ability to speak and understand English, we need to get a sense of how they process language and... Soldiers, no poor sap ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by being all that he can be. Damn the torpedoes or give me death. Eternal vigilance is the price. Oh. So remember, you are the best of the best of the few and the proud. So ask not what your country can do for you. Only regret that you have but one life to live. Yeah, okay, I know how to do this. Chip's speech here reads like one of those neural network scripts where they feed a bunch of real scripts into a bot and then it spits out new scripts based on what it thinks the patterns are, usually to mismatched hilarious effect. Now, the thing you might have always suspected was true about these scripts floating around is that most of them are fake. As in, a human person wrote something in the style of a bot and then just said that they fed it through a neural network. But it is technically possible to create a neural network model that spits out generated text like this. So I did. Another of my old colleagues from Lifehacker, Beth Squarecki, wrote a guide on how to use the text generation Python 3 module, which was created by Max Wolf of BuzzFeed to create your own custom text generating neural network model. She used it to create the Bot Cocktails Twitter bot that generates cocktails like the Merriness Fracas, the Poetic Splendid, or the instant classic, the Pain-Free Feasible, consisting entirely of one ounce of Bubbara. Perfect. Okay, so I want my neural network to be as screen accurate as possible. So I decided to use as my data input the entire script to small soldiers with everything but the dialogue stripped out and poorly formatted. Now, the term neural network gets thrown around a lot, but in a very basic, oversimplified way, it refers to a way of training a computer model by running data through various pathways of a node network, each of which performs a different operation on the data. Then it compares the output to some form of reference to see which pathway led to the best result. This model can then be used in the future to generate results much more efficiently. Imagine a microchip sophisticated enough to control the guidance systems of ballistic missiles. Then, imagine it can learn. What are you talking about? Artificial intelligence? No, actual intelligence. This works a bit like how human synapses work in the brain, hence the name. You can think of it a bit like how a baby learns language by just sort of making noises until eventually real words come out. Train the model long enough and on enough data, and sure, it won't be able to understand the nature of love, but it will at least be able to form a coherent sentence instead of he's a practromed to leprachil. If you want to try making one of these neural networks yourself, I put a link in the description to both the GitHub page for the project and the Google Colab notebook where you can try it out. You'll need your own text document of input data, and it'll probably require a lot of reading, so good luck! I ran my script through the network and generated an output that was mostly garbage, but I still managed to get a few usable lines that I could string together into some kind of dialogue. But I still need a way to make this guy actually talk. 
I started by looking into the Tigertron, Ti Tigertron? Tacotron 2 project. This is a neural network system that generates natural sounding speech that can be trained using a voice input. This is the same system used to create the Google Assistant voice that sounds impressively real for a computer. It also takes a positively massive amount of data and potentially weeks to process, and I didn't discover this until way too late to really fit it into the video. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, so I've been working on this video since March. So I think I need to find a way to lower my standards again. Works for me. So I turned to a simpler project called Real-Time Voice Cloning, which you can find on GitHub in the description. Instead of taking a ton of data and weeks to generate a voice, it can use just a few seconds of audio, in this case a sample of Tommy Lee Jones' voice, and mimic it in under a minute. There will be no mercy. Okay, you get what you pay for. It took a little bit of work to get this app installed, but once it was up and running, it didn't take long to record some audio files of my generated dialogue to play back later. Now, the final piece I need is for this guy to respond to voice commands, which was a problem. Okay, so real talk. Uh, I had a whole segment planned here where I was going to go through the various methods of adding voice commands to a Raspberry Pi, but I failed at installing all of them because they're all Linux packages and Linux is bad and awful because I'm bad at it and don't know what I'm doing. But the screen recording that I was doing to capture the footage of my failure also failed. So I lost all of that footage too. So instead, I'm just gonna have to skip ahead to the only way to add voice commands to this monstrosity that I'm technically capable of doing. Good enough. Now, it is technically possible to send voice commands from a Google Home to a Raspberry Pi using some project on GitHub, but instead, I'm going to use a simpler technique called faking it in Premiere because I want this video to be over already. So that just leaves... Step four, what if these toys could actually kick ass? Okay, yeah, refresh my memory. How did that work again? Well, screw that. Let's just put this all together already. At last, my abominable child is capable of movement, generating dialogue, reading that dialogue aloud, and responding to voice commands. Not all of it at once, mind you, but it, it is technically possible. Which brings us to the final completed product. Forget the fires. I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonite. The Gorgonites come. You see you there. What about our home? Oh, you can they be half here? It's part of this going down home. What are you of this? For here. Uh, uh, uh. So that was stupid. So, what did we learn today? 
I'm not very good at building robots, but it is wild that it was possible for me, a moron, to get this far. What seemed like outlandish, over-the-top technology just a little over 20 years ago is so commonplace today that a lot of it is free. In the movie, they say they were planning on charging $79.95 a pop for these things, and given the bill of materials I spent on this, I could hit that price point. But it's also probably not a good idea to do that. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that Small Soldiers is the pinnacle of techno satire, but in a clumsy kid movie kind of way, it does highlight how the mega corporations who develop the technology we use can have wildly different priorities than our own. The film ends with CEO Gil Mars showing up at the scene of the suburban destruction, handing out a few checks, and then suggesting that they should sell the toys to the military division because... I know some rebels in South America are gonna find these toys very entertaining. And then they cut immediately to the traumatized child who is so scarred by this incident, he only wants clothes for his birthday now. I swear, this movie is subtly brilliant. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that the magic AI processors existed inside Globotech for a while, but weren't being used because they were deemed not cost effective. The only thing that changed after children were injured and homes were destroyed was that now the CEO thought they could make some money from it. Now, I'm hardly a Luddite. I've written about technology for close to a decade and like, that Google Home I used earlier, that was just a spare one I have sitting around the house. Like, I have enough in every room and they give them away for free. Someone, please help me. I have three candles and 17,000 Google Home minis in my house. I'm drowning. But no matter how cool the tech we have now is, tech giants have to be more responsible with it than I am. And unfortunately, they often aren't. For example, Amazon has been criticized for tying its smart video doorbell product to a social network that police departments can access, which can exacerbate racial profiling. And that's to say nothing of the security issues that led to, for example, hackers breaking into ring cameras and broadcasting the video live on an illicit podcast. The idea of poorly developed technology becoming a nightmare for the average family isn't so much sci-fi fantasy. It happens. The only difference is in real life, the CEO isn't gonna swoop down in a helicopter to hand out checks. But hey, Small Soldiers is a satirical kids movie. I'm pretty sure people in real life would be a lot more responsible with the technology they're Oh, for fuck! Okay, that one got away from me. Um, this was supposed to be a small video to tide me over and this project spiraled entirely out of control. Animorphs 2 is coming. That's gonna be the next video. I was gonna like space these out a bit more, but I think this one just needs my full attention. So I don't know if I'm gonna get a video out every month-ish. I'm gonna try, but I've got Animorphs 2 is next and I have one other project that I need to get out by the end of the year. It's a big one. I think it's gonna be fun. Um, that'll come after Animorphs 2, and that's probably all I can spare uh, in free time right now. This was fun. I, I think I need to double check and make sure I'm not using any assets, but I think I can upload some of the blend files. Um, like I've got the, the background from the titles and the, uh, the major chip has it. I don't know if it's legal for me to distribute that since it's like vaguely based on an existing toy. I'll, I'll figure it out. If, if not, then oh well, you know how to make your own. And like I said, most of the projects I used in here are real. I will even include links to the ones I failed to use. You know, if you want to see more of this or if you just want to see the next Animorphs video, uh, subscribe because that's going to be the best way for you to find out. Um, but if you like this you know, tech exploration thing, let me know about that too because I, I like doing it. This was fun. It was exhausting, but it was fun. And I need to go scrape the ash off my garage now.